Later this week, I will be traveling, God willing, to Europe. And as I am preparing to travel, I will be visiting our local churches in Europe. And the brethren, when they heard, they asked me to preach there. They will be having given little small conferences. And then um, I asked, asked them, what do you want me to preach on? And then they said, oh, some of them brethren are interested in prophecies. They would like to have last day events and prophetic events to be addressed. And I said, okay, I can do that. But I also have some other topics if you are interested. I have something about justification, about the gospel, about salvation. And oh yeah, that's also good, no problem. However, uh, people seem to be more interested in what is going on and uh, where are we in the stream of time and to be a little bit curious how we understand current events which is good. The word of prophecy is very important. But brethren, let me tell you something. More important is how we are saved. We can know all the prophecies, we can know all the secrets, but if we don't know the person who saves, we are in problem. We have a problem. So I feel that we have to put in balance prophetic word with the word of salvation, with the gospel. And this is my last message here was a few weeks ago, I was speaking on justification. What is justification? And today, we like to talk about what is gospel. And if you remember justification, we spoke that justification has different possible meanings. It means could mean acquittal, like a judicial acquittal. You're not guilty, you walk free. Or uh, you can uh, have a kind of accounting process, attributing uh, your you know, simply imputed, you know, God's righteousness. And then it can also mean forgiveness of sins, but also it can mean transformation, it can mean renewal, it can mean new life. So there are different shades of meaning and aspects of justification. And then we focused on Romans 4, and we took an example of the perfect man of, I mean, man of faith, Abraham, and how Abraham trusted God, faith of Abraham. He completely surrendered his life to the Lord, and he trusted him implicitly. When in his old age, he could not have children, neither, neither here nor Sarah. And God said, you will have a child, and he trusted God fully. Not trusting the flesh, but trusting God. And God counted to him it for righteousness. However, today I'd like to go a step further and talk about the gospel. What is gospel? And if I would, uh, you know, some professors and teachers in college universities, when you start a class, they give you a piece of paper and they say, write your name on it, and then they will give you a quiz. And often students don't like such quizzes because he wants to test your knowledge, where you stand, how do you understand the subject matter. But the question, what is gospel? The people generally assume that they know what is the gospel. If you would ask people, they would tell you they know. Are you in that group? Think about your understanding of the gospel now and compare it with what you will learn from this sermon. So just think about that. You don't have to write anything right now. Just in your mind, Right now, think, how you understand the gospel? What is gospel? And then compare that with what we will learn today. So gospel is widely misunderstood term, and we will see that even Apostle Paul had problem with some Christians who misinterpreted the gospel. Is gospel important for Christians and for Seventh-day Adventists today? What do you think? Why? Let me read in Revelation 14, 6. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach to, unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation, and kindred, and tongue, and people. We identify ourselves with this angel, don't we? What is the content of his message? Everlasting gospel. And then what is there, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Yes, we understand the hour of judgment is come. We understand there is a call to worship God the creator. But don't forget that the message starts how? 
Yeah, but starts, the angel is proclaiming what everlasting gospel. Everlasting gospel. Gospel cannot be changed. There is only one gospel. And we need to understand that gospel. Yesterday I was speaking to my brother, and I'll give you a little bit hint why I consider this topic important. I told him, look, I'm preparing a sermon for tomorrow, and I'm thinking about the gospel. And I'm thinking about us as a people who are entrusted with the last message of mercy to be given to this world before the second coming of Christ. And we are told that this angel is flying in the midst of heaven and he is proclaiming with a loud voice this message. And we know that in Revelation 18, the whole earth will be lightened with the glory of that angel. Why we don't have that power? Why? That's a good question. Why people today are lacking that power? Because we will see in a moment that gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And so let us consider this all-important topic. Do we know the gospel? And do we proclaim the gospel today? And I'd like to introduce you now to the book of Romans, this magisterial, monumental piece of literature in the great magnum opus of Apostle Paul. And let me read, and I will come to this text later on. Romans 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, a separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Paul, in Greek, says, slave of Jesus Christ, owned by Jesus Christ, saved by Jesus Christ called to be an apostle. We know that Jesus Christ arrested him on the way to Damascus and entrusted him, you will be my chosen vessel. Separated unto the gospel of God. It's a gospel of God. This is, this is possessive genitive. It's not human gospel. It's God's gospel. We will see what does it mean. Which he had promised afore by him. Prophets in the Holy Scriptures. It was promised. And then we read verses 3 and 4. Concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. We will analyze this text later on, but just to give you a little hint here. Concerning, gospel is concerning who? Jesus Christ our Lord. Without God, Christ being our Lord, there is no gospel. We don't know the gospel. Which was made of the seed of David. So Jesus Christ became a man. That's incarnation. He, according to flesh, God became a man and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Verse 5 and 6. By whom we have received grace and apostleship, for obedience to the faith among all nations, for his name, among whom you are also the called of Jesus Christ. By whom? By Christ, by the gospel. We receive grace and apostleship for obedience of the faith. Faith and obedience cannot be separated among all nations. Gospel goes to all nations for his name, and you in Rome are also called. And then I skip a few verses and come to the central text. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein, in the gospel, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. This is text from Habakkuk 2. And I will come to this later on, but I'd like to just tell you, we should not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it is the power of God, in Greek, dynamis, from which we have the word dynamo, dynamite. It's the power of God unto salvation. This is objective, then, but to everyone, whoever, to everyone who believeth. That's a subjective part. We will come to that in a moment. That's a gospel. You need to believe it, accept it. For in that gospel is revealed what? Righteousness of God. From faith to faith, the just shall live by faith. 
But now, let me share with you in the, in the beginning also text from Galatians. Because in Galati Galatia, there was a problem with understanding the gospel and way of salvation. And I'd like to address this problem. Look what Paul says to Galatians. Chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. I marvel that you are all so soon removed from the Him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Brethren, is there a danger the gospel can be perverted? Oh, yeah. Be careful. Verses 8 and 9. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. In Greek, anathema. Anathema. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. You don't find in the Bible stronger language. If any man dare to pervert the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of God, let him be anathema. Let him be accursed. And then verses 10 to 12. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I had pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. When we preach the gospel, we cannot please the men. And if you read in chapter 1 and 2 of Galatians, you can find that some apostles, even like Apostle Peter, when he was with the Judeo-Christians, with the Christians coming from Judaism, he was kind of you know, accommodating to the Old Testament traditions on actually ceremonial law. And Paul rebuked Peter openly. Paul is not pleasing man. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which we was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. And brethren, remember in the early Christian church, the highest authority next to Jesus Christ or under Jesus Christ was first apostles. And they were prophets. Prophets were subject to apostles. Apostles laid the foundation of the Christian church. They lay the doctrine. No one can dare or should dare to touch this foundation. Now, what the Apostle Paul says about the gospel, we go back to Romans 1. Paul is the servant or slave of Jesus Christ. We should feel like that. If Jesus made us free, if we have experienced salvation in Jesus Christ, we are completely, as Luther said, I am a free man in gospel, in Jesus Christ, but I am born servant to Jesus Christ. I am completely under his control. I am owned by him. Paul is also called the apostle, separated. Separated. And we talk about that when we know the gospel, when we know Jesus Christ, we are separated for a special mission. It's a gospel of God, possessive genitive. It belongs to God, authored and owned by God. Woe unto anyone who dares to pervert and change, amend, improve, tamper with the gospel. And Luther, in his last sermon in February of 1546, said, he said, God is in the most envious position as a teacher because everyone wants to be his guidance counselor. Everyone wants to improve something, you know, and to twist and to do something. Don't dare to do that. No one can improve the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's a gospel of God. And let's now talk about the meaning of the gospel. And I ask you the question, what is the gospel? Let's now see what is it. It translates the Greek word evangelion. It's a very interesting word. I will not, my wife told me, don't go much into Greek. I will not go much into Greek today. But let me just tell you very interesting details. The Greek prefix eu means good. We have Brother Tom here who can speak Greek language. Eu means good. Angelion is announcement. Angel. Angel means, angelos means a messenger. Someone who brings a message. Eu, good message. Good news. Good announcements. That evangelion. We have for this uh, word euphoria, euphemism, eulogy, all this word, right? Eu, good, euphoria, euphoria, somebody is excited about something, euphoric. Euphemism, you go to a dentist 
and there will be some hurting. And he says, don't worry, it will be a little discomfort, right? That is euphemism. <laughs> eulogy, somebody dies, what is eulogy? Good speech about someone who just passed away. So from this source comes the word evangelion. English is gospel. <clears throat> is derived from Anglo-Saxon Godspell or good spell, a good story. This is where the word comes in English language. In classical Greek, Greek it was a re, uh, meaning a reward for good tidings and later on also good tidings themselves. There is one interesting document that you can find in, that, that was discovered by archaeologists in western Turkey. It's called the Prien calendar inscription. And let me tell you what it was. Actually, the uh, Roman Empire, just before the birth of Christ, this was written in 9 BC, just a few years before the birth of Christ. Augustus Caesar was the emperor in the whole empire, and the Roman Empire controlled all this territory. So local governors were actually erecting monuments and making changes. But what is uh, interesting that Roman emperors, Julius Caesar and Augustus, his nephew, uh, reformed the calendar. If you look at the calendar names today, they're almost all calendar names bear the names either of Roman deities, of Roman emperors, or Roman numerals. January, Janus, February, you know, Ma March, and so on. March, God of War, April, June, Juno, God, and so on. So you go, and July, Julius Caesar, Augustus, Augustus, Caesar. And that's, that's interesting. So what happened? They reformed the calendar. So in that particular part of Roman Empire, the local authorities adopted a calendar, Roman calendar, and started to count the first year of the year, uh, of the, of the year uh, first month of the year, with that birthday of Augustus. And let's, let's read this inscription here. Let me share it with you. Uh, they signal the day, the time uh, itself depends on the benef benefic beneficence of the new emperor. The inscription was made in 9 BC, records the speech that acknowledges Augustus as son of God, whose birth marks the beginning of good tidings. And the, the word evangelion is used there. And here is the, I can show you, this is the table. Uh, this is uh, in stone etched the pre and calendar inscription, and let me show you this inscription itself. It seemed good to the Greeks of Asia, in the opinion of the high priest Apollonius of Menophilus, Azanti, and Azanitus, and then he says, since providence, which has ordered all things and is deeply interested in our life, has set in most perfect order by giving us Augustus, whom she filled with virtue that he might benefit humankind, sending him as a savior, well, very interesting, both for us and for our descendants, that he might end war and arrange all things. So he's bringing peace, uh, Pax Romana, Roman peace. And since he, Caesar, by his appearance, ex excelled even our anticipations, surpassing all previous benefactors, and not even leaving the, to posterity any hope of surpassing what he has done. And since the birthday of the God Augustus, they call him God here, was the beginning of the good tidings, Evangelion, for the world that came by reason of him which Asia resolved in Smyrna. Now, look, I'm not saying that Christian gospels borrowed from this text and now, but that is very interesting how they are using this word, Evangelion, applying to Augustus as, you know, good tidings, that his birth benefited, you know, human race, including even them. But then coming to meaning of the gospel. There are three meanings, actually, and I'd like to share with you first two for, uh, in the beginning. Gospels means lit literally genre, which means the type of literature in the book. In the New Testament, we are having gospels, four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then we are having Acts of Apostles, which is historical book, and then we are having epistles, mostly Apostle Paul and the book of Revelation, which is apocalyptic literature. So this is first meaning of gospel means simply four gospels, literary genre. Then the secondary meaning, announcements of the arrival of God's kingdom. And it is wrong to see the kingdom as a completely future event. I'd like to 
We will talk in a moment about kingdom, coming of the kingdom. When John the Baptist and later on Jesus Christ were talking about the kingdom of, coming of the kingdom, kingdom of God is at hand. We often pass over that as no, no, not something significant. But what is the meaning of that? Do you know they did not mean kingdom of God will come in two, three thousand years from then? They were talking kingdom of God is right now here. What does it mean? Do you know if the Jews accepted Jesus Christ as their Messiah? Do you know that the history of this world will be completely different? Oh, <laughs> Jerusalem will be the center. But they did not. But here we will see in a moment, what does it mean kingdom of God is here? It's not completely. It was there. There is a distinction between kingdom of grace and the kingdom of glory. And this is where Jews made a fatal mistake. They were expecting, they did not distinguish between these two kingdoms. So when Jesus came, first time, he came to establish what? The kingdom of grace. What did he say? The kingdom of God will not come to be seen, but the kingdom of God is in you. So God's rule, God's reign first starts in human hearts. And then when people are transformed by the gospel, save the gospel, then he comes to establish visible kingdom of glory. But they, even disciples, were expecting kingdom of glory right now. And brethren, this is why I trust the Bible. When I'm looking at political systems you are having in the world today, you know, they're trying to improve the society. They're having revolutions. They're having all these constitutions. And to some extent, there is a difference. I agree. But there will never be peace on earth until people are transformed from inside. Never guarantee you 100%. You look at the news, more and more problems in the world. So Christ came to establish the kingdom of God, rule of God, reign in the hearts. And then will come kingdom of glory. And John the Baptist announced the kingdom. And I'd like to now share with you John the Baptist, his life and ministry briefly. Matthew 3, 1 and 2. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of God is at hand. It's near, it's here. Repent. And what else? John calls Jews to repentance and baptism. This challenged the law observant Jews. They need baptismal washing. Only converts to Judaism need to be washed and to be baptized. Now he's talking to the Jewish leaders and Pharisees. You need to be wa washed and you need to be baptized. And this was offensive. There is a call for repentance, metanoia, change of one's mind and the way of thinking. And that's very important, even for Laodiceans. Because you think, I am good. You say, I'm good and rich, you know, in goods. And, but you don't know. Change your way of thinking, how you perceive reality and your status, your standing before God. And what are prerequisites for repentance? The law of God, awareness of wrongdoing. As I was consulting and preparing this, I was reading a little bit from Lutheran sources. I was reading about Luther, where he was on the gospel. And then I saw Luther's small catechism. I mean, you probably know more about that, coming from Lutheranism. Do you know... You can check on internet. Many Christians and even evangelicals don't understand. In Luther's small catechism, the very beginning of catechism is the Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments. And then says the father at home should read the Ten Commandments to the children at home because you cannot come to repentance without knowing the law of God. How can you repent if you don't know what you're guilty of? We will come to that, how the law relates to the gospel. We are not saved by the law. We will come to that. But the law is essential to tell you about like a mirror, your true condition, but cannot take away your stain of guilt or, or sin, right? You need something else. But law is there. Law is there. But more than that, we need to see the goodness of God. We are told in the Bible that goodness of God leads us to what? Repentance. Why? 
When did prodigal came to the point of transition to change? When he hit the bottom and he was thinking about his father. And what did he realize? The servants are treated better in my house, father's house, than what I am, <laughs> how I live now. My father is a good man. I sinned against him. And then when he came back, he said, Father, forgive me. I have sinned against heaven, against you. Accept me as one of your servants. And then you see what father does. Now, when we see that, that brings us to repentance. So law is one thing, but we need to see goodness of our heavenly father. And there is a need for contrition. We are converted. We accept gospel. We repent not just for fear of punishment, but how we behaved yesterday and the day before yesterday. We feel godly sorrow when you think what I did yesterday and day before yesterday. I feel contrition. That is through repentance. And then we go on with John and his message. Verses Matthew 3, 8 and 9. Bring forth, therefore, fruits meet for repentance. And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able to these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Brethren, can we apply today to seven Adventists? Oh, we have a church. Oh, we have a prophet. We are part of this movement. Can we hear such a message as John the Baptist declared to the Jews? You know, Sister White writes that seven Adventists repeat literally the history of the Jews. So we have better watch. Oh, we have you know, all this uh, legacy. We have uh, all these prophets. We have all this continuation, succession. No, 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 no. Now look what he, he told them, bear the fruit. If you're genuinely converted, and I genuinely converted, there should be a fruit of repentance. What is the fruit of repentance? Fruit of the Holy Spirit. And fruit of the Spirit, one fruit is what? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, meekness, you know, gentleness. If we don't see these fruits, we are not repented. And then 10, look what he tells them. It's a very stern message. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and is cast into the fire. So you see, when this is agricultural metaphor. When people were uh, hewing the trees, they had an axe and they were cutting and cutting. Do you see a beaver, how they cut? They go around and go, you know, make, make this cone. And then the tree is standing just on one little thread and then one more swing of the axe, and that's it. He's telling them, watch. It's the last moment. You better make change and repent. Because one more swing, and you are done. Bear the fruit. Every tree which bringeth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. 11 and 12. I indeed baptize you with water and unto repentance, but he that cometh after me, is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will throw, purge his floor, and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. John is now saying, I am the forerunner, I am preparing the way, but there is someone coming after me who is much, much, much stronger, greater than I am. And he will baptize you. I'm baptizing you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit, with the Holy Ghost and fire. And his, in his hands there is a fan. You know, threshing, threshing floor, what they're doing? You are taking the wheat and throwing it there, and then the wind is blowing the chaff away. So Christ is there having that fan, and he will separate the chaff from the wheat. And he's there. He's with an axe, he's with a fan. You better make sure that you are on the right side, that you are the wheat. And then in John, we have a little bit more details in chapter 1, verses 29 to 31. The next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him and said, Behold the Lamb of God. You know, Bach and other great composers wrote, and also using Latin language, in Latin it's called Agnus Dei. 
the Lamb of God, behold him, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me, and I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore I am come baptizing with water. The, yesterday as I was reading and, and looking into this text, I just uh, looked on the internet and was watching uh, the place where John the Baptist was baptizing in Jordan River. And I remember I spoke to Brother Tim. Brother Tim just returned from uh, Europe. Uh, from Europe, yeah, from Middle East. He was there in Egypt and uh, Jordan. And he told me he was going to that site. And that's a border between Jordan and Israel. The Jordan River, part of it, it makes the border. So you can come and see that river. And John the Baptist was baptizing there. And Jesus came one day to be baptized of him. And he recognized in him holiness that he has never met before. And John bare record saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize which with water, the same said unto me, Who sent John to baptize with water? God sent him, right? God told John, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Now Jesus Christ, the Son of God, comes and John recognizes him and says, Behold the Lamb of God, take it, taking away the sins of the world. I bear record, I saw the Holy Spirit descending on him. And I was told on whom you see the Spirit descending, this is the Son of God, this is the Messiah. And then Jesus carries on the same message about the kingdom. Look, Mark 1, 15. And saying, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Same message. Time is fulfilled. Which time? Prophetic time from Daniel 9. You know that? 483 years. The last week started. He was baptized. Time is fulfilled. Kingdom of God is at hand right now. I am a representative of the kingdom. I am the king. By the way, we often neglect this. Christ was the king, true king. When he was crucified, we will come to that. They put on the cross, king of the Jews, right? When Pilate asked him, are thou the king? He said, you said it. You said it. I am the king. Believe the gospel. So we need to accept it by faith. Matthew 4, 23. And Jesus went about the old Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. You see, good news of the kingdom. And healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. You know, when he was casting the demons, he said, if I cast it by the power of God, then the kingdom of God is coming, has come to you. In the person of Jesus Christ, we studied in the Sabbath school lessons, God has come directly to humans to establish his kingdom here on earth. In their hearts, and then visible kingdom as well, as a next step. Matthew 20, 17 and 19, And Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the twelve disciples apart in the way and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and now pay attention. This is the gospel. The Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock, and to scourge, and to crucify him. And third day, the third day, he shall rise again. Did he tell them the gospel? Amen. He told them. He told them the gospel. But what? They forgot about it. The Gentiles remembered, but... And you will see, now he's meeting Pilate. And look at this dialogue in John 18, 33, 36. And the Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. 
Here, many Christians who may be well-minded should pay attention not to meddle into politics. Would you agree? They should. Our kingdom is not of this world. Jesus said, if my kingdom was of this world, then my servants would fight. No, my kingdom is not of this world. Let's go on. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. You said it. I am the king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. If you and I want to follow Jesus Christ, we have to love the truth, don't we? Gospel cannot exist without the truth of the Word of God. And Christ came to bear witness, but He's the King. And then He is ascending. I believe that Christians neglect ascension of Christ in the doctrinal system, then don't pay sufficient attention to that. And I shared with you now John 20, 29, when there was Thomas, unbelieving Thomas, who wanted to put his fingers in Jesus' body. Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen me and yet have believed. We are those who have not seen physically with our eyes, but we believe and blessed we are. Why, brethren? I'll tell you why. We spoke today in the Sabbath school lessons when the, Jesus' physical presence here on earth was very important. No question about it. But then Christ told his, his disciples before his ascension, suffering ascension, it is better for you that I go away. If I don't go away, the comforter will not come. But if I go away, he will come. Why is it important to a Christian church for the comforter to come here? Because through Holy Spirit, every one of us can have direct communion with God. We can be energized, transformed, accept the gospel. And Christ gave them to disciples, three of them, John, Peter, uh, and J pardon me? James, Peter, and John. Yeah, that's right. John, Peter, and John. So in the Mount of Transfiguration, he transfigured was transfigured and, and, and Elijah and Moses appeared to him. And that was the kingdom of glory in miniature. Christ shone and when that light came, they were terrified. But Christ revealed to them that future kingdom of glory that will come one day. Moses representative of those who slept and are resurrected and Elijah those who will not see that. And then in Acts 1, 6 and 7, when they therefore were come together, and they asked him of him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father had put in his own power. Don't worry about the kingdom of glory now. Don't worry about that. But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Christ is telling them, don't worry about the kingdom of glory. Think about the Holy Spirit. You will be witnesses of my resurrection, my power, death and resurrection. Praise the Lord, brethren. This is wonderful news. And now look what Christ on the way to Emmaus after his resurrection Look what he says. He's talking to two disciples. They don't recognize him initially. But again, you see the gospel. What is the main point as we go through this text? Pay attention, what is the gospel? Luke 24, 27. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning whom? Himself. Now at this point, when we come to Pentecost and to Christ, Christian church, now the shift is now moved from the kingdom. Kingdom is now of glory future. But the, it's, it's moved to the person, to the king himself. King. This is what is gospel now. And he said unto them, things concerning himself, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you. That all, we just read it about. He told them before. 
that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law and of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning who? Me. Me, Jesus Christ. Absolutely. So you see, brethren, what is important here? Jesus Christ, his life, his person, and what he did is the gospel. That's the, that's the gospel. Jesus Christ. Yeah. And let's see. Let's see one more verse. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer, to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. He told them point blank. That's the gospel. The whole scripture center on me, on my suffering, my death, my resurrection, my ascension, and sitting at the right hand of the Father. That is the gospel. That is the gospel. So that quiz, what is the gospel? God loves us and has a wonderful plan for our lives. I heard one preacher who was actually a professor of theology, and he was having... Um, doctoral candidates in minister, uh, doctoral ministry and he gave them a little quiz what is the gospel at the beginning of you know his lecture and he said believe me or not this is not scientific test it is anecdotal nine out of ten not but not giving the right answer ministers in evangelical conservative churches <laughs> and people are saying what is the gospel look People are saying God loves us and has a wonderful plan for our lives. True, but this is not gospel in the, in the narrow sense. This is the, something that precedes. Jesus can give meaning to my chaotic and seemingly purposeless earthly existence. Also true. But this is the result of accepting the gospel. The good news is that I can now have a personal relationship with Jesus. Also true. Gospel is that I can have my sins forgiven. Again, all true statements, but they are not the gospel. They are results of the gospel. They are consequences of accepting the gospel. All these things may be true enough, but not one of them individually or collectively is the gospel. So gospel of the king, the gospel has a specific content. It has an objective content and a subjective content. The objective element gospel is the good news of the person and work of of Jesus Christ. Remember that. In objective sense, gospel is the person and work of Jesus Christ. The gospel is the message about the incarnation of God, which incarnation was promised beforehand by the prophets. And if you want to see biblical evidence for that, you go to the book of Acts and see what the early Christian church preached. You can go to Peter's Pente Sermon on the Pentecost, you can go to Stephen, you can go to Paul, you can find what they preached. Jesus resurrected. I'll give you some highlight, main points of the gospel they preached in the book of Acts. Jesus' resurrection, God raised Jesus from the dead. Jesus' life and death. Jesus did many miracles, suffered and died by crucifixion. Jesus' exaltation. God glorified Jesus, raised him to his right hand as Messiah, Prince, Savior, and our High Priest. Prediction. All this happened as predicted in the scripture, according to scriptures. And salvation, because of Jesus' resurrection, people are exhorted to repent and are promised forgiveness, grace, salvation, and new life in his name. And finally, restoration. Jesus will return and establish his kingdom. That is the content of the gospel in the book of Acts. Brethren, if we are preaching the gospel today or everlasting gospel, we should preach these things should preach these things. And I could spend hours preaching on them individually. And let me give you an example. In 1 Corinthians 15, most Bible scholars agree this is one of the oldest professions or expressions of faith and the expressions of what is gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved. Look, this gospel, Paul, saved. If you keep in memory 
what I preach unto you, unless you have believed in vain. And now listen what he says. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, that how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, see, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's the gospel. Brethren, don't be surprised when we come to seven Adventism. You know what happened in 1888? Minneapolis. We were preaching law until we were dry as the hills of Gilboa. And then the Lord sent this most precious message through Elder Bagwan Jones, Christ our righteousness. We have to put in balance the message. That's the Bible, straight from the Bible, from Apostle Paul. We can never diminish the very core of the gospel message. Salvation is in Jesus Christ. And then Romans 1, 1 to 2, again, I'm repeating. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Why they are emphasizing according to the Scriptures? Christ did not want their faith to be based on miracles or even his post-resurrection appearances. He wanted the faith to be based on what? Thus says the word in scriptures. He was going from Moses through all the prophets showing in the Bible what is written about him, that our faith is based on the scriptures. Christ is the fulfillment. Now imagine, you, know, you, you can test it. You go to the Jews, contemporary Jews, and tell them that Jesus is the Messiah. And you will see what the early Christians faced. That's it. And if you, you can find on the internet uh, Jewish rabbis in rabbinic Judaism, many of them are rejecting Jesus as the Messiah still today. Some of them, I heard, not allowing his name to be mentioned in a synagogue. It's a false god, right? So we have to a little bit come closer to the time when apostles, when Paul was writing, this was the present truth. These men from Nazareth, he's the Messiah. He's the promised Messiah. He's the Son of God. He died for our sins. He resurrected. He's ascended to heaven. So we have to understand what this means. Romans 3 and 4, concerning his Son, again, Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. The resurrection was affirmation that he was the Son of God. And Holy Spirit was involved in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Look, Romans 8, 11. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. So if God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, he can raise you and me in spiritual life. 1 Corinthians 15, 4. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching in vain and our faith is in also in vain. But now let me, in the second part or closing part, come to the subjective part of the gospel. You can believe, theoretically, all this what we have stated about Jesus, his, his person and his work. I mean, as a theory, but not accepted by faith. Will it benefit you? No. The gospel is about who Jesus is and what Jesus did. This is objective content of the gospel. But subjective element is personal appropriation of the benefits of Christ that accrue to us. And this is done by faith. If there is a corporate church of the Christian church, um, sin of the church, Christian church in our age, it is the sin of seeking to find the power of God in any other place than in the place where God stored the power. Today you are having this, oh, we want to evangelize, let's have programs. Let's have some kind of, you know, strategies and so on. I'm not against programs and strategies, but if we do not know and believe the gospel, 
in the gospel is the power unto salvation. Without that, everything is in vain. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is power, dynamis, of God unto salvation to everyone who believe it. You have to believe who believe it, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. You need to have personal faith to live, to be justified. And let's talk about profession and salvation. There is a misunderstanding of the key terms. Profession of faith, and this is many pastors, evangelists do, and this is not wrong, don't take me wrong. They're asking for decision, for profession calling people to the altar. Or maybe you're just standing, you're sitting in your pews, you, you raise the hand, you accept Jesus. Or there are cards with sinner's prayers. You take the card from the pew, you read, you know, say, and you believe, and then you accept Jesus. Calling for decision is not wrong, but we mistake profession of faith for salvation by faith. What do I mean by that? I mean the following. We are not justified by the profession of faith, but rather by the possession of the saving faith. Profession is important, not sufficient alone. There must be something else. Romans 10, 13. Look at this text, how we need to carefully interpret them. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is from Joel, remember, in the Sabbath school lesson today. And Matthew 15, 8, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Huh? Can we profess and our heart be far away from the Lord? Oh, uh, yes. Profession alone is not enough. Matthew 7, Sermon on the Mount, 21, 20, 20. Not everyone that saith to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. So, brethren, profession of faith, this subjective aspect of the gospel, means that we are power of salvation, power of God unto salvation. We are transformed by the gospel. We have fruits of the gospel, fruits of the Holy Spirit. And Luther, let me say again, interestingly, preparing his sermon, uh, actually lecture on Romans, what he said, he recognized in Romans that not, that is not the righteousness by which God himself is righteous, but an alien righteousness. God imparts into you and me the righteousness that God freely gives to those who are not righteous. We cannot earn it. We cannot deserve it. We cannot work for it. Rome perverted the subjective righteousness. Let me explain what I mean. Roman church, they understood the objective gospel basically, not perfectly, but basically. Jesus was born, virgin birth. He lived a sinless life. He died on the cross. He resurrected. He ascended. He will come again to rule. The church professed that. But in a subjective part, how you appropriate the righteousness of God, this is where they erred. And they were saying, okay, you need a church, you need a priest, you need a confession, you need a, you know, these uh, sacraments. Otherwise, you cannot receive the righteousness. Yeah, indulgences, rats, absolutely. So you see, this is how they corrupted the gospel in that subjective sense, created a barrier between a person and God. And this is in Galatians 1, 6, and 7. Paul is talking about that. I marvel that you also are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ and unto another gospel, which is not another. Paul is saying there is no another gospel. This is just called the gospel. It's not gospel. But there it be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. We must today, as God's people, defend the gospel. There is only one gospel. Galatians 3, 1. Look how he calls them. Foolish Galatians. Who had bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ had been evidently set forth, crucified among you? Who did it? You received the gospel and now you are going wrong ways. You are trying to be saved by works or by law. I don't have time. I will preach another time how the controversy over the law in Galatians was um, developing Adventist church. Because when they came to these Galatians Adventists, there was debate, 
Is Paul writing against ceremonial law, or is he also addressing moral law? And spiritual prophecy answers both ceremonial and moral law. That was the problem. They were trying to obtain righteousness by keeping the ceremonial law and also moral law Ten Commandments. And now, brethren, there is a confusion in the Christian world. Please understand, law is perfect, good, holy, nothing wrong. But the law in our fallen condition cannot save us, cannot justify us, can condemn us. So for justification, you need something else. You cannot come, go to the law to be justified. And this is what they were trying to do. Galatians 1, 8, 9. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach you and any, any other gospel, then that which you have, we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you, then that you have received, let him be accursed. It's a very strong language. In Galatians 1.12, For I neither received it from man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. And then, look in chapter 2, verse 16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Christ, Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. We plan to have in this church, we will be renovating God within church, and we plan to put the Ten Commandments, one tablet here and one over here. That's fine. It's the law of God. But I said I wish we could have some other symbol, but I don't know which one to use to represent grace. <laughs> well, it's a little bit controversial. So, you know, I, I understand. But brethren, please understand this. When you see the law of God, it's holy and perfect. You cannot find justification. No way. Do you understand me? I'm not against the law. This is what Paul is saying here. Simply the function of the law, the purpose of the law, is to reveal to us God's holiness and perfection, show us our true condition, and lead us to Christ. Lead us to Christ. And from Christ we receive justification and righteousness. And now when you receive the gospel by faith, what is this gospel doing to you through faith and through Holy Spirit? Leading you into obedience. God writes his holy law in your heart. But this is the result of salvation that comes by faith through grace. You understand? Just the order is, you, you start with the law, leading you to Christ, from Christ. Let's, it's, look, you are dirty. You come to mirror, to your washroom, you see the mirror, and mirror shows you are dirty, your hands, face, whatever. But mirror cannot wash you. You need water and soap to be washed. So they have all their proper place, but the purpose of the law in fallen condition cannot save us. And that's Apostle Paul saying, don't come to law to find salvation, come to Jesus Christ by faith. I'm not ashamed again, this is a power of God unto salvation, I'm coming back to this. Faith transforms. I'm crucified, but now I wish to close with that, how Paul now shows you what happens to you and to me once we accept Christ. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. If you can be justified by law, then why Christ needed to come? That's a common sense. <laughs> but now many Christians make a mistake because now we have Christ. They say, oh, we are not under the law. Now we can, you know, you don't have to. It's a yoke, it's a burden, it's a curse. How short-sighted they are. Because once you are justified, you are being sanctified. What does it mean? You are led, God writes his holy law. This is the new covenant, right? I will write my laws in your heart, in your mind. Not everyone will teach his brother, know me. Everyone will know me. So, born again Christian who is justified by the blood of Jesus, by faith and grace, he will not intentionally violate the law of God. He will live in obedience, but by the divine power. 
For do I persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, should not be the, I should not be the servant of Christ. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. Paul is saying, I am not pleasing men. I'm not pleasing Judaizers in Christian community. I am faithful to God. I receive the gospel from Jesus Christ directly. And I declare it to you. And now, Revelation 14, 12. What is this? This is the remnant people. Rather mentioned today about what is remnant. Brother David. This is the remnant. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. They're in perfect balance. They keep the commandments not to be justified, but because they are justified by faith. Just shall live by faith. And that faith, like Abraham's faith, is a saving faith which produces works, good works. Was Abraham obedient to God? Oh, yes. Was he keeping his commandments? Yes. Will he command his children after him to keep the commandments? Yes. But you start with a faith. Right? And that faith is not opposed to the law of God, but produces that fruit of obedience. God's law is in your mind and heart. And then, this is my last scripture, Revelation 18.1. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. Let me ask you a question. What is this glory? That This is the final, this is the latter rain, this is the loud cry. What is this glory? A revelation of character of God. It's the righteousness of Christ. We need that experience. We need to know what is the gospel. Everlasting gospel. And then, we will proclaim the beautiful messages to this world. And then Jesus will come. I hope, brethren, that in this study and sermon today, when you go home, that we will have a clearer picture of what is gospel. I repeat, in objective sense, the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Who he was, who he is, and what he did for us. That's first thing, objective. Subjective element of gospel is accepting him by faith as your personal Savior and Lord. That's a gospel. And when you have that experience, you're a born-again Christian, and you obey the Lord, and you say, Lord, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? That's a response of a born-again Christian. Obedience of faith, right? obedience of faith. I live, but not I. Christ lives in me. Can he keep the commandments in you? Absolutely. May this be our experience. Amen.